And now we will have another major tenant, which will be the USL. It's official, professional soccer is coming to Spokane. Today, a committee with the Public Facilities District chose the United Soccer League to play in the new downtown stadium. What that means for Spokane. Weather's pretty quiet right now with partly cloudy skies, but I'm tracking some snow Wednesday night and Thursday that could lead to a slick Thursday morning commute. Dozens of tents dot the sidewalk outside of City Hall. Demonstrators say they want the city to open more low barrier shelters. The city says hundreds of beds are available and going unused. Tonight, a closer look at the issue and the move that council made just last night. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Kremton News at 11 tonight. I'm Mark Hanrahan. New tonight, Spokane Mayor Nadine Woodward has appointed a new director of the Spokane Community Housing and Human Services Department. Jen Sarasades will take over the new role on January 3rd. She previously has worked with the both Spokane Neighborhood Action Partners, or SNAP, and was a member of AmeriCorps VISTA program. The position remained open when former director Cupid Alexander there resigned and later accused city administrator Johnny Perkins of treating him differently due to his race. Mayor Woodward later ordered an investigation into those allegations. As dozens of tents lined the sidewalk outside of Spokane City Hall in a plea for more shelter beds, the Spokane City Council approved a plan to put people in hotel rooms when shelters are full. Crampton's Amanda Rowley spoke with homeless advocates and the city about the plan. Good evening. First, I want to give you a lay of the land. This tent city here behind me at Spokane City Hall is referred to by organizers as Camp Hope. These people have been camping out here outside City Hall since last week, and they got notice that they have 48 hours now to remove their items from the area. Anything left behind will end up getting thrown out. Now, organizers of this peaceful protest, as we mentioned, are asking for more shelter space. And I talked to a few different people who are camping here, and they insist there is no shelter space available in the city of Spokane. But most of them told me they haven't really tried to seek it out. Now, others have said they have been turned away from shelters because of barriers like sobriety to get admittance. If they don't want to uh, invest in low barrier beds, then they should invest in a space for people to create a tent city, a safe space for them. Now I confirmed with Hope House, which provides 100 beds for women in Spokane. It's been at full capacity for the last week, but Spokane City spokesperson Brian Coddington confirmed with me 106 beds were available last night through its entire shelter system. Now those spaces were at Catholic Charities, UGM, Family Promise, and the Young Adult Shelter. So for those who are here and those who are advocating on behalf of them, we would strongly encourage them to direct the people to shelters to, to spend the night out of the elements in a bed or in a in a space that is indoors. Additionally, last night Spokane City Council approved a resolution that secures 40 hotel rooms a night when the Cannon Street shelter is full. And that, of course, is operated by the Guardians Foundation. Now, how it works is people will check in at the Cannon Street shelter and from there would be directed to the hotel for those overflow rooms. 20 of the 40 rooms have already been made available this past week. The remaining 20 will soon be available as well. Now, I want to be clear that 48 hour notice that people received here at this Camp Hope tent city outside of City Hall is not in response to the additional bedroom or beds made available through that contract with the Guardians. This that contract had been in the works for about two months. Again, Brian Coddington had told me that this notice was issued to people here because of growing safety and health concerns outside of City Hall. Reporting from Spokane City Hall, Amanda Rowley, Krem 2 News. Well, the weekend snow was finally enough to open two of our local ski resorts. Mount Spokane posted this picture on the left hand side of your screen just a few days ago. They posted that they waited to see how the snow accumulated before announcing their opening day. Well, the snow passed the test and they are ready to open this Friday, they said. Meantime, 49 degrees north also planning to open Friday. They posted the photo on the right hand side of your screen making that announcement. They also said this weekend will be the grand opening for the Northern Spirit their brand new high speed quad chairlift. So exciting news there. On that note, let's bring in meteorologist Michelle Boss joining me here in the studio tonight. Michelle, what are conditions going to look like this uh, this weekend? Are they going to get even more snow? 
Uh, yeah, we're not looking at any big storms in the short term to bring heavy mountain snow, but it's certainly going to be cold enough. We don't have to worry about that snow melting, certainly in the mountains and then uh, in the valleys as well. Temperatures are cooling down. In fact, we're down to the 20s right now, so it is going to be a chilly start to your Wednesday morning. Currently 26 in Spokane, 25 in Deer Park, mid 20s in Moses Lake, even Lewiston sitting right at freezing. Pretty quiet out there right now. In fact, we got partly cloudy skies, had a few snow showers over the mountains today. Those have long since dissipated. So here's a look at the next 12 hours. We'll see clouds return tomorrow and temperatures staying at freezing or below snow moving in Wednesday night into Thursday it should be light but could lead to some slick morning and afternoon commutes on your Thursday drier weather on Friday with an overnight low of 15. Michelle, thank you very much. The Spokane Public Facilities District Board voted unanimously to bring the United Soccer League to the city's new downtown stadium. Spokane will be home to one USL men's professional team and one women's pre-professional team. Gram 2's Janelle Finch tells us how the board came to that decision. Just a few weeks ago, ground broke for Spokane's new downtown stadium right here. Thanks to the Spokane Public Facilities District, the USL will be calling that stadium home. The board met for a special meeting to make their decision. In addition to the United Soccer League, Brett Sports was also in the running for the stadium contract. Ultimately, the board went with the USL because it proposed both a men's and women's team and hit other criteria the board was looking for. To bring soccer to the city, Spokane is coming with its own team of players as well. The Public Facilities District has a partnership with the Spokane Public Schools for the downtown stadium. Spokane Public Schools is building the downtown stadium. The Spokane um, Public Facilities District will be the operator of the stadium. And now we will have another major tenant, which will be the USL. According to Spokane Public Schools, the district is putting $31 million into the stadium. Once it's completed, it will be able to host district football and soccer games and now two USL professional teams. In Spokane, Janelle Finch, Creme 2 News. The man accused of randomly shooting at people at a Post Falls gas station returned to court today. 32-year-old Tyson Sterkel right here is facing 12 charges. This is video from the shooting where two men were hurt. Both are expected to recover. At today's hearing, a judge agreed to continue Sterkel's case until early next year. His attorney did ask about lowering his bond, which was set at $2 million. The judge pushed that decision to Thursday. Detectives have an update now on the disappearance of a five-year-old Grays Harbor girl. They now believe Oakley Carlson was last seen alive in February. Investigators say it's a credible tip, but not the big break they were hoping for. Five-year-old Oakley Carlson was reported missing earlier this month. After a school district employee in Carlson's hometown of Oakley was worried about her safety after talking to a sibling. According to detectives, Oakley's parents, Jordan Bowers and Andrew Carlson, have been arrested on abandonment charges regarding another child, but they are considered persons of interest in Oakley's disappearance. At this point, she was last in the care of her parents, and, and unfortunately, the reality that she's going to be recovered in safe and sound is becoming smaller and smaller. The family owns a 315 acre property. Detectives have searched that land for days with volunteers, dogs and drones. but They didn't find anything. Detectives say they have other tips and leads to follow up on, but they are still waiting on that big tip. Oakley's parents remain at the Grays Harbor County Jail on that abandonment charge. They're accused of failing to provide medicine to a sibling of Oakley's. They'll be in court at the end of the month on that charge. A former Seattle Seahawk accused in April of killing six people in South Carolina before taking his own life suffered from severe brain damage. Researchers at Boston University say Philip Adams, a corner who played one game for Seattle back in 2011, had stage two CTE. Symptoms of that include anxiety, paranoia, memory loss and aggression. Researchers compared Adam's brain damage to that of former NFL player and convicted murderer Aaron Hernandez, who was diagnosed with CTE after murdering a man and taking his own life in 2017. The city of Spokane has given out millions of dollars in rental assistance. Coming up after the break, we'll hear from one local landlord about how it's helped him, plus how you can also apply for that assistance. Plus, later in the broadcast, more than 100 people still unaccounted for after a tornado outbreak in the Midwest and South. A look at the massive recovery process later in the show.